Hey guys, um, so I want to start doing recaps for a new game that I'm running on Monday nights. Um, we call it uh, Blood, Bone, and Shadows for reasons which will be uh, obvious pretty soon. Uh, but I realized that if I'm going to do recaps, everybody's going to be lost unless I set the stage for what we're actually playing and what we wanted to do. So, uh, as this is my Monday night group with whom I've been playing for a couple of years now, since 20, wow, since 2014, actually. So it's been a while. Uh, we, as a group, we like, um, a low magic type of game, more sword and sorcery, more historical fiction, almost. Uh, but we always appreciate a touch of magic. Um, the last game like that that we played uh, uh, I ran and I felt it to be a little too low on the magic side so uh, I wanted to inject a bit more magic on it um, we were uh, playing a science fiction game Shadowrun and then we decided to go back to fantasy for a while and try it again and I wanted to try my hand at uh, GM and once more so you know knowing from our session zero that you know we wanted this sort of low magic but not as low as we had done before with a little bit more magic a little bit more mystery um i wanted to to add not only this element of magic but make the world a little bit more solid we used to play burning wheel and the time we played burning wheel uh i was coming up as the GM with world development on the fly and and that's always cool but it also runs into the danger of uh, it, it made me feel that the world wasn't real I had to develop it you know once uh, a certain amount of sessions went by and I had developed all these different elements on the fly then it started feeling real but I wanted to kickstart that process from the get-go so um what i decided to do is you know i talked to the guys about this setting called shadows of estrin which i'm sure a lot of you may have heard us this is the this is the uh, prologue book book zero this is free on on drive through i believe it's free i think you can get it um I have been buying all those books slowly, so I have a huge collection of the Shadows of Estrin books. Um, I'm on the Kickstarter, I'm looking forward to the next installment, but um, the reason that I wanted to use uh, Shadows of Estrin as a baseline is that it's real, it's solid, it's somebody else's work that I can easily adapt for my own, and use as the basis for the game now i wanted to use that as the bare bones baseline right and build on top of that change what we want add or subtract from that setting what we wanted until we tailored the setting in the campaign to our own particular tastes right so and this goes a little bit into the my process for uh, developing games like this, right? So what I wanted to do is uh, just give this uh, the cultures, the names, the setting, the places, the maps, use those and then build on those. Now, fortunately, uh, we we kind of like a sort of Celtic feel to our, our world. Uh, one of my players, uh, Neil, is very heavily into Irish culture and mythology. I know very little of it. Um, but I, from what I know, this, the, the setting of, of Shadows of Esrin feels, uh, pretty, uh, pretty Celtic, um, as is. It also has a nice visual reference, you know, it, it serves to inspire one as a GM. And so, what I did was I took the glossary from, I think it's book one, I think the end of this book has a glossary on the back, and I read through it, and I took out all the words that I liked, and I typed them out with the definitions, and I created a sort of uh, glossary document that I could share with the rest of the guys. So over a series of emails and one session, like we, we spent like two, maybe three hours talking, we took this baseline and expanded it. 
um, Shadows of Estrin is very Celtic uh, with the setting, but it also has a steampunk element to it with these mage scientist types. Uh, we decided to cut that off and throw it out, and we changed a couple of the names, like we didn't like the Tricasal name for the peninsula, so we used the ancient name of the peninsula, Craig, or Craig uh, Peninsula. Uh, and so, um, we, I had this idea in my mind that I wanted to explore this theme of the castle people versus the village people. Hey, there's a song in there that you might... Uh, you might think of a couple of, th of songs once I said that, but this this castle culture versus this village culture, um, and the setting seemed right for it. So what I got in my head is this castle, you know, the phrase castle forged steel, right? So they have like this better technology, more advanced, and so the first thing that came to mind was the Norman invasions of England uh, with the Anglo-Saxons. But I figured, okay, so let's make it our own. Let's make the uh, Norman equivalent uh, invade the uh, the Celtics, the, the the Celtic people, right? So they're not Anglo-Saxons; they are Celts. Um, so we invented this uh, uh, people, the Alaran people, who come into this land and invade the Calisians. We call the peninsula Calicia, and um, so it's an invaded people, right? It's a uh, they, they took over the rulership of the area, and now, you know, they've been here for like 50, 60 years, and they command the region, right? So the next thing I did is it was make a map. Let me see if I can show the, you the map here. So what I did first is I went into the books, and I dug up all the regions, and, you know, I, I when I did the glossary, I hadn't really read the entire books, right? I just skimmed through them. Uh, but from the glossary itself, you can glean a lot of information of what the world is like. And I took all the maps, and the maps, they have this region in the in the prologue book, they have this region called uh, Loch Varn. And it's a map that pretty much resembles this area. So I reinterpreted it and, and drew it myself. And then I took the uh, Derg Valley out of book three, uh, which is uh, a campaign that's currently being published. And it's basically uh, this map here. So once more, I translated that map, you know, into my own art, such as it is. Uh, and I came up with these two valleys. Um, Book Zero also describes the village of uh, Melwyn. Uh, and describes, you know, a castle, Castle MacLear, right next to it. So immediately with that as a baseline, I began drawing this map. Um, this was, uh, there is a campaign map uh, which shows the relative locations of these three places, but it's just dots on a map, basically, and a big forest. It shows this village, which we renamed into Kells, which is an actual Irish uh, village, and it has this forest here, so I incorporated all of that into our master map. Um, there's also a location nearby, which are these ruins, and another town uh, spelled out, which is this town, Kagan, so I just, I just put it all in there, and this is the stuff that was included with the map. And then the guys said, you know, this, this setting is nice, but, you know, it, it needs to be bigger. We need to have more, more room to roam. So, you know, I, I bought a second uh, poster board, and what I did is I kept building upon the map. Now, I cheated, and I took a location here, which is Mudan. I took it off uh, another of the supplements. I think it's, I think it's again, it might be, um, oh, geez, now I don't know which one it is. One of the books, uh, it might be book two, uh, details this region called Mudan. So I just took that whole area, plopped it into my map, and then I just started improvising. So the rest of this is just me doodling and, whoops, uh, that didn't work out. Let's, uh, let's undo that. Let's get all these lines out of the way. There we go. So, um, you know, I just 
Jose, one of my players, said, just put a rival clan in there. So I came up with this uh, uh, village down here. They live in a small plateau. Uh, there's a river. There's a large lake. And I'm thinking that this southern clan is the enemy of the northern Mechlear clan. And, you know, all these villages, they drain into the central road. Uh, uh, Neil said, put an inn in, in there. So here's a windmill with an inn. Uh, he also mentioned put in a ruined town. So I have a ruined town and ruined castle in the middle of the valley. And so this thing, I just started interconnecting and made a few passes through the mountains, connecting the Lochvarn region from the game with, uh, you know, the region of Mudan and the lower Vale, which is, again, all basically my creation. But that's, that's pretty much the, uh, the setup uh, for the start of the game. Now, uh, the guys make characters. Um, oh, wait, before we made characters, then the second question is, well, what game are we going to play? Um, we didn't want to go back to Burning Wheel because Burning Wheel does a lot of things right, and, but I don't think it does the monsters and the magic well enough, or at least not well enough for my taste. So, you know, we threw a couple of names around of many systems that we were used to, Right, And I said, the, the thing that we're going to do here is we're going to pick a main system and we're going to tweak it. You know, we've played all of these systems raw for years. And uh, I feel we have enough uh, level of confidence and, and, and level of proficiency with the games where I feel absolutely comfortable just uh, tweaking these games, right? I'm making them my own. So we did a poll, we voted... And, you know, the, the game that won out was Blood and Bone. So, you know, that's what we decided to call our campaign. So it's, uh, you know, Blood and Bone and Shadows. Um, so the guys made characters. The, the beauty of Blood and Bone is it, it has that deadly sword and sorcery feel. It is low magic by definition. Um, it is a greatest hits of a game. It includes a lot of elements from D20 games. I think it's most closely related to stuff like Pathfinder, but it, you know, in its, in its base mathematics, much simplified, of course, uh, it incorporates the, uh, advantage, disadvantage, uh, 2D20 model from fifth edition. It incorporates a different wound system. It incorporates a different magic system, very bare bones. That would be my one criticism of the game, um, which works for what it's trying to do. If you're trying to do, you know, very deadly, very low magic, uh, almost pseudo historical gaming, it's a good system. But if you want to add magic on top of it, you might want to do some tweaking if you don't want to use the included setting, which I didn't want to use. Um, but uh, it also includes things like uh, beliefs, right? Which is straight from Burning Wheel. Uh, and we're really, we came together as a group by playing Burning Wheel. So we thought it was a great opportunity to add everything together. Because the thing is, I've noticed that there's this mathematical equivalence to Pathfinder. So I think adapting monsters from Pathfinder to Blood and Bone is really easy. I figured out a way to do it. I'll maybe talk about it at some later date if anyone's interested. But I figured out a good conversion system where you could just plug the monster and put it in um, to Blood and Bone. Blood and Bone does have rules for making monsters, but at some point I felt, well, did these seem rather arbitrary and I have no benchmarks. The other good thing about Blood and Bone is that it is very, it feels unfinished. There's no healing rules. They ask you to basically come up with some healing rules to, to, to your taste. And again, the magic system is very bare bones. And all this says to me is, you know, this is a, a, a fruitful void. This is a good space where I can just put my own stuff in. And it's quite easy to add stuff from D&D, &D basically, or Pathfinder. So then the guys came in and did some uh, characters. And let me see if I can pull those up real quick. Okay, so Jose is playing Cormac 
Gottfried's son, he describes it as a man caught between the two worlds, right? Between the, the castle people and the village people, right? So he is a knight. He's a half-breed. So he's caught between these two cultures. Um, he's sort of a knight, sort of a ranger. He has some training for that. Um, the village culture, the, the Celtic culture, includes many gods, right? And the castle folk uh, follow the one god, uh, which is basically the one from Shadows of Estrin. It's it's sort of like a Christian god with the serial numbers filed off. Uh, so it serves the purpose, again, of putting the two cultures in contrast and conflict, which is what we wanted. So, you know, he wrote his beliefs. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, he wants to belong to to the people he sort of wants to straddle those two worlds and, and bring peace and he will start you know by using his skills to protect the people uh you know to protect the people from the threats of the wild whether whether they are alaran or calician right um he i asked them to write beliefs about each other so um let's see uh he did a belief uh, about Neil's character, who's a bard uh, called the Blackbird. We'll we'll get to him real soon. Uh, but you know, he he added uh, a belief that that he wants to learn from the stories that the bard can tell. So he wants to keep him alive. He has a self belief, you know, basically about his uh, code of conduct and you know, uh, and and what he wants this character to. To behave ass, right? Uh, uh, to prove his that he is a worthy knight. Um, then we had Arthmael. Oh wait, no. Let's do the Blackbird next. So the Blackbird is uh, Lochlan Morda, uh, the Blackbird of Kells. He is a bard. Um, he uh, Neil envisions the bards as the keepers of records. This is a uh, culture that subsists on an oral tradition. So the bards are the record keepers, you know, they, they, they record events and they travel all over the land uh, learning uh, what's been happening, learning, you know, judicial decisions and stuff like that. So they're like record keepers. So if you want to know what happened um, or what decision was made in a, in a legal case, it, it's the bard who can fill you in. So he wrote his beliefs. Um... Uh, about learning, you know, the lore uh, under the hills and the histories of, of Craig, um, of the peninsula, right? So he, he's, he's a knowledge seeker, is his belief. Uh, he wrote a belief about the druid, which is the third character played by Todd, and the uh, Shadows of Esteran uses the word Demorthen to denote a druid. Uh, so, you know, uh, Lachlan, the blackbird, believes that the Demorthen carries the wisdom of their people, so he will follow uh, the, the Morthen's instruction, uh, right? Um, he also is a peace-loving man, so he, he, one of his beliefs is, you know, now is not the time for unkindness or violence among men. So that's sort of his uh, behavior. And then finally, we have uh, Arthmael, the bone speaker. Uh, he is the uh, druid-like equivalent in this land called the Demorthen. We changed it a bit, uh, Todd wanted to uh, sort of make this religion up himself as opposed to just taking the religion straight out of the book. Um, so uh, he, he started delineating the principles of the, of the Demorthen. So it's like a combination between like Japanese uh, Shinto type you know, the, the lots of spirits and there's, there's also a combination with a worship of nature and uh, also respect for the deceased ancestors. And so he, he made this bone speaker, this man who wears a bone armor made for from bits and pieces of bone. Um, he chose as his one magical spell um, an equivalent of speak with dead. So his character, if he obtains a piece of bone relating to, uh, you know, a dead person, he can just use that to communicate and get knowledge in the form of yes or no questions. The way this game works, you have to roll to succeed at magic. 
So what the way we're doing it is, you know, I set a difficulty for the questions that he asks. He rolls. If he succeeds, then I give him a yes or no. If he fails, then I just give him a vague vision or something to that does not directly answer his question. Um, and then as he asks uh, subsequent questions, I just increase the uh, the level of difficulty for the follow-up questions. So the way uh, uh, Todd described Arthmael, um, he is also a wandering druid, right? So he the, he walks through the land with the bard with him. The the Morthen, the druid, dispenses uh, justice, and the bard records, right, the results and. Uh, the decisions laid down by uh, the, the Morthen. Um, he is the high priest, effectively, of the Celtic religion, right? So he is in opposition to the priests of the one God. Um, the way we conceptualize this is there's not an active inquisition to destroy the pagans, right? Because these people are relatively recently conquered, maybe a couple of generations, like 50 years ago, so or maybe less. We, we've, it's very nebulous how long ago this happened. Um, but the point is, they don't want to crack down on the pagans, right? Because that would only cause the people to, to rise up. Uh, you know, they, they are taking the approach of slowly infiltrating their culture into uh, the Calesians, right, to spread the knowledge of the one God. And that is basically the setup we, ha we had. So, um, I, you know, I took a bunch of names from the books. I just took all the locations detailed in the book, which I put into my map, and I made lists of the NPCs and the names of the chieftains, and, uh, you know, got a bunch of names that I can read off and I can improvise based on that. That was the first step. Uh, in subsequent days, I did go through the books, and because because this started a couple of weeks ago, like almost a month, I would say, and so I've been uh, reading slowly through the uh, Shadows of Estran books, and the way I use those pre-written adventures and uh, locations is I I just keep what I like and I discard everything else, and I get the bare bones situation of what's going on. Maybe I pick a monster from the from the described book and say, "Oh, this monster is cool. I like it. I'll use it," and then translate it into something else and improvise all the details, all the reasons why the monster is there. It's very highly modified from the from the um, actual published material. So, if anybody is going to watch these videos, this recap videos that I plan on doing from our sessions, you might get spoilers from uh, from all of the Shadows of Western material. So far, it's Book Zero, Books One, Two, Three, and the Monastery of Tuath that I have access to. I think they've published a couple of extra books, which I do not have access to. I'm anxiously awaiting the second part of the Derg campaign, Book Four, and the Book of Secrets, but, you know, at this rate, I don't think I'm going to get either of those, so I'm ready to roll with it. But I have used, uh, because I have read all of them, I plan on using the major plot points from all those arcs. Uh, so if anyone, anyone is interested in playing Shadows of Estrin, th this spoilers, you know, just be, be aware of that. Uh, although, again, it is heavily modified to suit my particular vision, right, my tastes. Um, so as I've read, I've incorporated more NPCs, more monsters, and the general gist of the situation. So, so far, we, we played two hour sessions, and so far we've played three actual, you know, not counting the session zero. So it's four sessions total, but let's call it three half sessions, if you will. Uh, so it's six hours of actual play. I will be doing recaps of those, and hopefully I can keep doing those as we go along to help uh, preserve some artifact of our play, and also um, just because it, it, it will serve, hopefully, as recap for whatever the next session is going to be. So I hope that isn't too confusing. Uh, I'll probably have to 
explain a little bit as we go along on the recaps, but uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that, and, uh, well, looking forward to doing more of these. Bye-bye.